I would like to say hello to all of you out there, um, to our breakout session, LP's Asset Allocation in Alternative Opportunities Trends. Um, I hope that we will not have any technical issues, but I think that we have done some tests before, so everything should work. Um, my name is Sebastian Scholder. Uh, I'm managing partner of uh, Weilburg Family Office. Uh, we are a traditional family office and also investing a um, lot of our money in private equity. And I will take over the moderation uh, of this interesting panel discussion today. Um, together with me, um, uh, there is uh, Mr. Andreas Bertel. He is head of group asset management at Unica Insurance Group. Um Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, Ms. Valerie Brunner, um, she is managing director and group head of institutional clients at Raiffeisen Bank International. And uh, Ms. Bernadette Ules, and she is head of private equity at Capital Bank. Um, Hello. Together with us, there is also Ms. Letizia Bayar. She, uh, I can't see her, but I hope uh, she can hear us. Um, she is head of origination at Rothschild and also, oh, oh. there she is. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> yes. um, welcome to Vienna. <laughs> um, I would like to jump right into the topic if it's okay for you, because I think we have not, not very much time, although these are 50 minutes left. Um, from my point of view, um, this despite its many advantages, um, private equity is still not an integral part of many portfolios. Um, my first question goes to you, Mr. Bertel. Uh, as far as I know, Unica is currently considering making greater use of private equity uh, as an investment uh, in the portfolio. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit what is the motivation behind this? Sure, sure. And uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for having me here. <laughs> um, and indeed, we are currently considering making some changes to our strategic asset allocation and uh, increasing the, the role of, um, of the private markets asset class or asset classes in our allocation. Um, and, and there are really several reasons for doing so. Um, one's an, an internal reason, you could call it that. Um, if you look at the, at the business models of a, of a large in insurance company or institutional uh, investor, um, there, there are some things we are especially looking for uh, when, we do, when we do invest. And, and some of the most important ones would be, would, would revolve along um, long-term value accretion, for example. Um, as we are long-term mm -hmm. funded, we, we look we're looking for something that that matches this funding on mm -hmm. the on the asset size side. Uh, we're looking for uh, reasonable low volatility on the economic side, even more reasonable, say, low on the accounting <laughs> side. Uh, we're looking for stable, predictable cash flows, and we're also looking for asset classes that uh, would give us a premium for the due diligence that we are willing to undertake mm -hmm. and the uh, liquidity that we are willing to forego. Mm -hmm. Now, um, many of these boxes uh, check quite nicely for private, um, private markets in different degrees for the different private markets asset classes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's a reason why many um, uh, institutional investors have a kind of a private markets journey they undertake, maybe starting with uh, uh, infrastructure debt, mm -hmm. um, which ticks all of the boxes more or less, um, a private debt, infrastructure equity, and, and finally, maybe as the last station, then um, a private equity, mm -hmm. um, which is still very, very attractive um, and, and ticks many of the boxes. So that's, that's one internal reason for doing so. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's obviously uh, there are other different reasons as well, some more market related. Um, now, I'm sure we all don't want to talk about that anymore, but still it's, it's here. It's uh, this low interest rate environment. Of course, yes. Um, and I don't think it's, uh, it's a reason for, for simply jumping into new asset classes and, and buying whatever has, has high nominal yields. That, that's not so much the reason. But um, I think this low interest rate environment, it serves as a kind of a catalyst. Mm -hmm. um, it, it speeds up the internal discussions. Now, um, I'm sure we are all aware of that. Uh, large institutions, they tend to have a, a tendency towards the status quo. Let's mm -hmm. call it like this. So it, it takes a lot of energy to overcome inertia mm -hmm. and to to uh, make everyone understand why you want to do something different. Mm -hmm. Now, the low interest rate environment somehow cuts this discussion short mm -hmm. um, because everybody understands that you're looking for new ways to improve the, yeah, the risk return. And, uh, and that helps um, in establishing or in, in understanding, making everybody understand why you're looking at different things. Um, you still have to prove that it's reasonable to do so, um, but it, it helps overcome initial inertia and resistance, I would say. Okay, yeah. 
Yeah, very interesting. Um, Ms. Brunner, uh, you've just launched a new fund this week um, that it, it will deal with the topic of Austrian growth companies. Um, how do you assess the current demand for such funds or the private equity uh, market or private markets in general uh, from Austrian investors, in in mainly institutional, because I think that's mm -hmm. your, your core business? Um, yes, by all means. I, I mean, I think it's it's quite uh, natural or intuitive that I would refer to what uh, <laughs> Mr. Bertel has just mentioned, because uh, I think for institutional investors uh, nowadays it's quite hard to um, beat with the, the, the traditional bond al asset mm -hmm. allocation to beat inflation rates. Uh, it's, it's hardly... Um, sustainable to, to concentrate the asset allocation on the conservative metrics that have been used uh, for many years now. Mm -hmm. So that is, uh, I think, one good supporter for, for institutional demand for such, an, for such a private equity initiative. And then on the other hand, um, I think one can see over many decades that uh, the performance trend of small caps has always beaten in their growth uh, path the performance of those very huge tech giant large caps. Yeah. And uh, therefore I think investor demand will, uh, will, be, will be substantial and relevant because they everybody needs to, to, to achieve yields mm -hmm. now. And uh, if one can manage the risk in a way and you have talked about volatility and mm. uh, that you that you'd rather not uh, not uh, see too much of it neither in the neither in in, in your PNL nor in any other ways um, then I would guess a large uh, granular granularity and a diversified portfolio um, might combine both aspects mm -hmm. quite well mm -hmm. and therefore I would think uh, there is a lot of activity uh, of liquidity in the market. Mm -hmm, there is course. need from the corporates, so mm -hmm. actually it's quite kind of intuitive to match these two mm -hmm. streams. Of course, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and Ms. Ulis, in your role at Capitalbank as head of private equity, you would have a good insight into um, the allocations of private investors uh, mm -hmm. as well as foundations. Um, how do you think the demand for private equity or private markets in general um, is developing? And do you see a development similar to the, uh, to the trends uh, mm. in the institutional world? Uh, yes, I can, I can agree. Uh, our customers are wealthy families, wealthy people, foundations and uh, enterprises. Um, uh, with uh, respect to the risk return aspect, we use private equity as a complement to the conservative uh, portfolio management um, according to the modern portfolio theory of uh, Markowitz. Mm -hmm. If a customer like or has the ability to use illiquidity, we, uh, we suggest them to invest part or whole of the equity allocation in private equity. We were one of the Austrian uh, private equity missionaries because we did our first investment in 2003 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and our customers as well uh, and in a mezzanine fund. Um, at that time, it was there was a really huge distrust in the asset class. So now there are 17 years ago, um, we see the first customers expi uh, exper has experience with private equity and has a whole private equity cycle, uh, has a whole private equity cycle. Uh, and they are familiar with the asset class mm -hmm. and most of our customers are familiar with the asset class. Mm -hmm. So there is a steadily growing demand in private equity annually, so really annually. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, but do you also see uh, a rising demand from, from, I say, smaller investors as well or yes. is it just... Okay. Yes. One reason is I think also the low, in low interest environment as well. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Ms. Bayard, can you hear me? Perfect. Uh, I can't hear you, but I, I'm, I'm quite fine when you can hear me. Um, with over 20 years uh, <laughs> of experience, uh, you've probably long experience in private equity um, today. Um, how do you assess the current development among investors? Is private equity now being increasingly taken into account uh, when uh, investors are considering changes in their asset location? Yes, hello everybody. I think there are several reasons uh, why this industry will uh, continue to, uh, to attract new investors. I think uh, as uh, Andreas, Valérie and Bernadette uh, mentioned, uh, they are definitely key characteristics of the industry. 
First, uh, perhaps, is obviously the visibility that we have now on the performance of this industry. We have 20 year track record performance, and um, we know that across cycle and across prices, even though the current crisis is very different, uh, this industry has outperformed our performances. So, I think this is one first element. Obviously, as uh, Valerie mentioned, the pool of it also to be uh, allocated. We do think that there will be opportunities emerging from this crisis as there were from previous. I think another element that uh, was mentioned earlier is uh, obviously the, uh, the low interest rate environment, which is uh, also all the uncertainties that you may have on the professional real estate market will definitely attract more money. And I think, last but not least, uh, investors have also learned the lessons from uh, the previous crisis. Uh, they've understood that you can't really time the market and that having a stop-and-go policy uh, in terms of investment allocation is, is something that is not uh, the best to maximize your, your return in private equity. So you have to be steady investors uh, over several years to really uh, bear the fruits of your investments. And in fact, in this crisis, until now, uh, for the last seven months, we haven't seen uh, investors really selling down their portfolios. Uh, they've been more, um, for some of them, on the pause or in a wait and see uh, approach, but they haven't really sold. Um, so I think uh, they've learned the lessons and, and they are just waiting to see how things are developing uh, before taking some, some decisions on their allocations. Okay, okay. Very interesting. Um, but uh, do you also see an increase in demand? Because you said, yes, um, investors are more steady and, and don't sell their positions. But do you also see uh, an increase in the stake of their portfolios uh, institutional investors are allocating? I can't hear you anymore, Sebastian. OK. Um, then I will just move on until the technical issues are finished. Um, Ms. Udes, um, that I think we can agree that the demand from institutional and private investors uh, for private markets is rising. Um, in your opinion, can you the current supply or the offer for these investments in Austria satisfy the increasing demand? Uh, or do you see any kind of hurdles for uh, funds or, or managers to raise capital or for investors to invest? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, in my point of view, the biggest hurdle is the Austrian law. Um, we completely understand to protect retail investors, they need a higher level of protections, but the Austrian law also protects qualified investors. I talk about private foundations, high net worth individuals, enterprises who have really a huge, uh, strong financial background and most of them also understand the private equity market. I think um, it, would, it would make sense do that the corresponding laws in Austria will change based on the German Luxembourg model. This would be desirable. Um, from the international uh, uh, fund manager perspective, Austria is not really an important market. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. And, 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 the, and the reason is, as you mentioned, uh, not yet, the reason is that there are really, really not a handful of institutional investors are really interested in private equity. International fund managers would passporting their funds to Austria as well if there are more private equity appetite uh, from institutional investors. Mm -hmm. Capital Bank, um, as I mentioned, there are less passported funds to Austria. We directly conduct the fund managers to get access to the mm -hmm. funds and in to invest with them. Okay, okay. Um, Mr. Bertel, as a re representative for institutional investors today, mm -hmm. um, you probably do not have a free ticket for private equity investments either, um, if you look at the regulatory environment. Um, in your opinion, where do you see possible hurdles for Unica or other institutional investors mm -hmm. um, to invest? Well, you're absolutely right. There's definitely uh, not, a, not a free ticket for, for uh, <coughs> private equity riches or something like that. Um, as for the hurdles, um, I think every type of investor has a unique set of hurdles that are uh, higher or lower depending on, on, the, on the investor background. Um, if you think about 
smaller investors, um, uh, individuals, private investors, um, due to to them being smaller, they probably don't face face a lot of, of internal governance hurdles and, mm -hmm. and, and things like that. They are nimbler, much quicker to decide. Um, on the other hand, um, <coughs> they will very often simply lack the, the financial resources mm -hmm. uh, to conduct a well-diversified international private equity approach, yeah, for example. Um, large institutions usually do have the resources. Mm -hmm. um, however, um, as I mentioned in, in, in my first statement, um, they will probably have first have to overcome a lot of government uh, uh, governance issues, um, maybe some regulatory hurdles that mm -hmm. they have to jump, um, 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 regulatory capital things they have to overcome. So that would be a natural first hurdle, really. Mm -hmm. um, the second that comes to my mind, the second hurdle, um, and, and I, I would urge anyone not to underestimate this, uh, it's the operational thing. Mm -hmm. um, most investors, I dare say, come from the uh, come from public markets, liquid markets. They are all their their background, their systems, um, front to back office integration. It's all skewed towards and aligned with uh, public markets, mm -hmm. um, and and um, and that's a huge undertaking and a steep learning curve you have to go through uh, to to make your your whole. Um, uh, institutional backbone except private market. Mm -hmm. um, so to give you a picture, um, a, an industrialized um, machine hall with lots of robots, um, mm -hmm. that, that's, that's how you, you can picture your, your current front to back office interface. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what we built for the last 10 years or so, to have this automatized, um, error-free, um, no, no um, double entries somewhere. It, it, it it's supposed to run smooth and and um, uh, and very nicely for huge volumes of, of trades, government bonds, usage funds, um, equities whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So, and now you come to this sweatshop, like um, <laughs> a manufacturing workshop. Uh, no deal is is similar to the next one. So mm -hmm. you have to put on in a lot of manual effort, mm -hmm. um, and the problems don't stop with the with the front office. Mm -hmm. I mean. You're used to writing Bloomberg tickets. Mm -hmm. Forget about it. Yeah? <laughs> so, you, for the smallest deal, um, you have to read tons of paper, and you have to read them. Mm -hmm. And you start, you know, calling your the chairman of your board of directors in his vacation because he forgot to sign some small paper, mm -hmm. and, uh, and 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 that's the small, trivial kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, upgrade your back office. Absolutely, please do that. Otherwise, your CFO will soon pull the plug on the whole operation. Mm -hmm. Um, and your whole uh, private equity concept vanishes in mm -hmm. thin air uh, because your auditors would, would shoot it down. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is the kind of thing I, I really have to urge any, anyone, everyone to not to underestimate. Um, you, you absolutely have to, to increase in the quality and quantity of, mm -hmm. the, of these capacities. And, and I've not even started about the market itself, which yeah, offers some steep of uh, hurdles, of course, in finding the right deals and, and so on. Okay. And how many uh, of these hurdles have you already <laughs> 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 passed? <laughs> um, as I said, we have the advantage of being a large institutional mm -hmm. um, uh, um, investor. So yes, we tackled each of these hurdles. Um, and for some of these hurdles, the efficient way to, um, to overcome them is to take some money in the hand and invest. Um, in internal capacity, in external capacity, that may be one of the reasons why Austria is not the big private equity, private markets hub that we would like to be mm -hmm. like it to be. Um, so either you, you pay somebody else to do that for you, mm -hmm. which has its own set of problems, mm -hmm. or you internalize the solution, mm -hmm. which is something only big institutions are able to do, or it's only feasible for them mm -hmm. to do so. Yeah, of course it is. Um, Mrs. Brunner, do you support um, Mr. Battle's opinion or what do you see in the market um, when it comes to other institutions? Um, are there differences or is everybody on the first step um, towards a substantial private equity uh, core team or, or core setup? Mm. I mean, to start with, of course, I support Mr. Battle. <laughs> 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 um, uh, secondly, I would say, um, yeah, I, I, I would divide the hurdles that we are we have analyzed for ourselves. Yep. Um, maybe maybe alongside the three potential segments of investors that uh, we want to address. Yeah. Um, I think what you have mentioned before, Bernadette, uh, 
the, the interest of, of private individuals and of small family offices, small foundations or trusts uh, will, will uh, highly depend on whether we jointly achieve to, to kind of increase the knowledge of the market mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. instruments like these and mm -hmm. about this asset class. Yeah. Uh, Austria mm -hmm. doesn't have a history at all mm -hmm. of private equity so far. So. Uh, I think there will be a lot of uh, work from us jointly to kind of make it make it understandable, easily explicable uh, what it is about, what the risk really is, and what the mitigants and benefits are. Mm -hmm. um, I would say on the on the side of the banks as investors, as potential investors, like like uh, we are one, but many others are as well, and hopefully more to come. Uh, one of the main hurdles. Uh, is the regulatory environment, mm -hmm. yeah? um, because mm -hmm. uh, actually quite similar like it is for, for insurances, for us we are, as, a, as banks, we are, it, it really I would say is rather prohibitive the, the regulatory mm -hmm. treatment of banks' investment into private equity funds. Mm -hmm. And um, there are cures for it, but mm -hmm. uh, we are yet there to, to actually um, achieve to, to execute them. Yeah. So for us, the code word is Basel IV. Mm -hmm. This is what the banks um, very well know about, mm -hmm. and the the risk weight that we have to that we have to attach to a PE investment is uh, increasing considerably if we do not manage mm -hmm. to find a structure that actually keeps it very much similar to uh, traditional public uh, public uh, either equity or debt investment. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So I think hurdles, hurdles are there, but uh, they shall not keep us from addressing it because otherwise we, if we keep doing like we did uh, the last uh, 20, 30 years, <laughs> um, we will not achieve different results. So we have to... Mm -hmm. Um, kind of adapt our behavior, and then I think we can we can build up a decent mm -hmm. PE market also with banks as investors mm -hmm. and institutional investors and PEs, private individuals, etc. Yeah, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. And I would use um, the regulatory environment as an anchor uh, for my next question to Ms. Bayar. Um, as an international uh, LP, how do you rate the Austrian market? So do you uh, also see any kind of entry hurdles, like for example the the, the legal structure of local funds or a uh, shortage of supply uh, of investments? Thank you, Sebastian. So I think the, the Austrian market for us has always been a market where we wanted to, to invest in. Uh, I first visited Austrian LPs and GPs 20 years ago. Uh, <laughs> but so far, in fact, we have not been able to do investments in uh, an Austrian fund from a primary perspective. Mm. But we did it through a secondary, uh, which we are happy of. I think that the question is not so much for us, the, the market in itself, we are, for instance, investors in uh, two Finnish funds. And Finland is a, a country of 5.5 million inhabitants, so smaller than, than Austria. The question for us is really the offering. Uh, and as a foreign investor also, the question has been the size of the funds, which were small and not necessarily uh, perhaps too small compared to, to what we could invest in terms of uh, ticket size and portfolio construction. Mm -hmm. Also, um, Austrian funds rarely uh, market themselves outside of their frontiers. I guess, mm -hmm. you know, uh, they, they can raise easily locally. So they are not very well known uh, neither. Mm -hmm. and, and they are not uh, really um, explaining much about the market opportunity outside. So I think that there is something here that, that can be done uh, as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm also very glad to, to be here today so that uh, I can meet GP uh, after this conference. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's great to hear. <laughs> I think someone in, at the panel is just <laughs> typing an email. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm contacting you already. Okay? <laughs> no, um, but then uh, I would like to 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 uh, put my next question uh, again for you, Miss Bayar. Um, you've been active um, as an international LP for a long time. Um, how do you currently act as an LP? So what do you think are your main roles or tasks as an LP? And do you see changes in your position as an LP um, over the last few years? Yeah, this is a, in fact a very important question, Sebastian, that you're asking. LPs definitely have a role to play, and it's not just being at the board of the funds in which they invest to ensure that the strategy is followed. 
but it's uh, really to be a real sparring partner with uh, with the GPs and make them evolve on several topics. Mm -hmm. And even if you're not at the board of the fund, you can still have a role to, to play and to make things uh, evolve. For instance, in terms of reporting standards, expectations, in terms of the transparency that you're willing to have during the fundraising mm -hmm. due diligence, mm -hmm. in terms of the balance of terms between GPs and LPs, also in terms of ESG implementation, we've done that a lot uh, a few years ago and we still carry on with, with the GPs we have invested in where at the, at the beginning ESG was something that they were just uh, discovering. Um, but it's also, for instance, diversity in their teams, you know, and not just at the junior level, but also at mm -hmm. the at top level. So it's not imposing anything at all to, to GP, but it's really having discussions and engaging the discussion with them on that and being helpful also to to them and to their thinking. So mm -hmm. uh, definitely the idea is not just to, to make a, a ticket in a fund and, and wait uh, 10 years down the road to see, uh, you know, if they're wealth a fund, but it's uh, plenty of other discussions that, that we're trying to have with the GPs. And I have to say the GPs are are really listening. They're trying their best. You have, you know, sometimes a bit of a resistance here and there, uh, but, but with a uh, good discussion with the GPs, you, you get the things evolved. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Um, Mrs. Brunner, you've probably also just dealt with the position and the role of the LPs in great detail over the last months. Um, what role should an LP um, play from your point of view? Um, yeah, I think uh, one of the dominant roles would be to avoid, at least, I mean, yeah, we, we have, we have uh, thought a lot about it as RBI now just entered mm -hmm. as, an, as a kind of an anchor investor into our new fund project. And um, so from the bank as being an LP, I think one of the main targets is to avoid any situation of a possible conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. So this is my predominant, uh, mm -hmm. um, I would say, endeavor. Uh, so really make sure that the governance is right, that the fund manager is completely independent, obviously with an excellent track record, knowledgeable, experienced, whatever. but that the fund uh, management decisions, investment decisions are, are done according really to a clean, independent governance. So that LP interests and uh, um, GP interests are really not uh, contradicting each other. Mm -hmm. um, another role I think would be to really m kind of manage the dialogue among LPs. Mm -hmm. I think this is something uh, in the in the investors board then uh, one or i mean there will be several uh, lps represented and uh, uh, one can and should take a role in kind of uh, moderating and, and aligning the interests that then should come out of one voice versus the uh, versus the, the gp yeah so that it's a clear message actually going back and forth and uh, um, yeah, and then I can only join what you have said before. Um, I guess being a, a networking and sparing partner, but also a, a remover of potential hurdles, is a third uh, is a third role that an LP can play in order to support the GP, but also the targets eventually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Mr. Bertel Unica is one of the most important institution investors in Austria. Um, how do you see your task and role as an LP? Mm. So, and, and what are you thinking about when implementing uh, your private equity program? Um, how are you planning to act as an LP? Mm. Um, well, of course, and it goes without say saying that uh, our fo first and foremost intention when, when um, going into private markets is, of course, to make money or rather to, to improve the risk return uh, setup, <laughs> of course. Uh, but uh, having said that, um, I, I can I can fully support what we've just heard um, about the role of the LP. This is not the passive role that you are used to in public markets where you buy a fund or buy, buy some equity. Probably you don't like it, you move away, but um, mm. uh, you're, you're not really engaging. And, and also this this situation that you have co-investors that you are probably stuck with for, for 10 years or so mm -hmm. something, um, that's that's a kind of a, uh, uh, a situation where you you need to build trust and to be trusted. Um, you are in the in the market and in this business for the long term. Um, so there's one thing I, I 
I can strongly advise everyone who's um, who's uh, contemplating going into the mm -hmm. into the market, and that's read the documents. Um, and uh, I mean, it it sounds trivial, but um, um, there's there's so many instances, and I, I hear that in in the market. Um, we don't need that. X Y Z is investing. They are huge. I'm, I'm sure they've done all the due diligence. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. You have to read it, and you can't rely on anyone. Mm -hmm. Not even your own legal department. I mean, that they are good, but that they are not the ones investing. Your own portfolio mm -hmm. management has to read this. Of course. Um, and that's that's something that's also totally underestimated. And only if you understand what's going on, who has which rights, um, what's the governance in the deal. It's so important. We heard we heard about that already. Um, and those people directing the investment and then managing the relationship mm -hmm. with your co-investors, but also with the managers. It's not us against the manager. It's a partnership. Um, only if those people really understand the, the bits and the bolts of the whole construction mm -hmm. um, uh, can you make an impact. Mm -hmm. um, now, we are on an international um, uh, level when we, when we think about our, our private equity investments or private markets and private Fair equity right. investments. Um, so, big in Austria means okay-ish internationally, <laughs> let's put it that way. <laughs> um, so in, in many of those deals, um, we are not the dominant partners on the table, but mm -hmm. we, we do two things. We try to have a moderating role a little bit mm -hmm. in, in, in to the extent we, we um, have the chance to do so. But I think there's one, uh, one positive uh, aspect that kind of radiates back in Austria. Um, we have access to, I believe, some of the most sophisticated managers and investors mm -hmm. globally uh, by uh, by means of our investment strategy and uh, we learn a lot we see a lot and we we see how things are done on an international level and um, that's the kind of experience and know-how that we are we are able and willing to bring back to Austria mm -hmm. when we contemplate um, uh, investments in, in local um, endeavors and that um, also should give a kind of a comfort to our co-investors but also comfort to local or international managers that, that come to Austria to have an experienced party here, mm -hmm. okay. um, which is certainly an, an advantage. And there's one last advantage that's also not to be underestimated. Um, uh, it's a um, familiarization of the regulator with the topic. Mm -hmm. um, being the first one or one of the first to implement a new asset class, something as potentially controversial as private equity, yeah. is very enriching. Um, <laughs> And may may take some 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 uh, it, it time and has a steep learning curve. It, it's not for everyone. Let's put mm -hmm. it that way. But uh, if you allow me a, a short joke, um, it's there's only one thing that's worse than a well-informed regulator, and that's an uninformed regulator. <laughs> right? So um, that's the kind of knowledge we try to bring back. Okay. Um, I think I can summarize that it's, 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 it's a lot of effort to implement uh, a, a private equity or private market strategy in a, uh, such a big institution. Um, but uh, I'm sure that private investors or small investors are also able to invest or uh, uh, making, uh, making a deal together with banks like Raiffeisen or Kapitalbank. Um, but Ms. Ulis, how do you see the role of private investors as LPs? Because mm -hmm. um, the, invest the amount of investment is not that huge, so you're not able to interact with the, mm -hmm. uh, with the GPs as well as uh, institutional investors. Um, how do you think that um, private investors can take over their role as an LP? And how do you at Kapitalbank uh, support mm -hmm. them? Uh, I completely agree with all the answers before, so <laughs> I totally agree. Um, w w what is the rule? Uh, how can a private investor invest in a private e equity fund? Is the first question. And then normally, it's not uh, to invest directly in a private equity fund because you need a minimum investment of five million mm -hmm. to get a good diversification in uh, your private equity mm -hmm. portfolio. You need eight to twelve funds, so you have you need a really huge asset under management to get a good diversification in a mm -hmm. private equity set. So what we are doing is um, we launch asset linked notes, uh, which the performance of the asset link nodes directly uh, perform or directly directly linked to the performance of the private mm -hmm. equity fund. We use the rule as a limited button because as uh, hedging measures, we have to invest in the private equity fund 
and our limited partner. We use all the limited part partner efforts. We changing the management team, uh, key person, event, handle the uh, conflict of interests, mm -hmm. lifetime extension. We do all these issues for our customers. Mm -hmm. We. Of course, we do the same as you. We, we work closely with the management team. We talk to them in the corona phases. We talk to them every two, two weeks. We call them every two weeks and get updated mm -hmm. information about the companies. Uh, and our customers have also the possibility to talk to them once a year or more often if they wish. We look at all the transactions. We look, look at the valuation to the costs of the fund uh, and compare it to the the forecasts, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the strategy this the, the, they told us is this the same strategy. Normally, you look at it in the due diligence process. It's a, a main uh, main step in the due diligence process. And if we are invested, we look at the strategies. Is this the same strategy, what they suggested or what they wanted to do? Mm -hmm. um, yes, and before we, and we give all the information to our customers. So. Mm -hmm. um, and before we really invest with a private equity fund or in a private equity fund, we, uh, we work really closely with the private equity fund manager. We know them years before, um, uh, know the team, uh, talk to all team members from junior to senior level to know who is really important for the team. M could be there a conflict in the team or on the senior level? Mm -hmm. More often you know it from the junior side. <laughs> Um, it's, it's, it's really important uh, to strengthen the trust to the management team and vice versa. It's people business. Mm -hmm. yeah. Of course. Yeah. So I think it's very important, especially for private investors, um, to work together with banks or, or other yeah. uh, consultants so to enter the market because it's a huge effort to enter the market yes. by themselves. Yes. yes. Of course. Um, yeah, I think we have to look at the time, but we have some minutes left. Um, Finally, um, I would like to deal with the subject of trend literally. Um, so uh, what trends do you see in the area of LPs with regard to topics or investment strategies? Um, do you see any kind of strategies emerging or is ESG coming more important in the private markets uh, sector as well? Um, do we just, okay, perfect. Um, so is ESG come becoming more important? Um, so maybe just a uh, short, short answer, um, beginning with you, Ms. Ures. Mm -hmm. Fortuna fortunately, there was formed a, a venture community in Austria in the past few years, and we see more and more customers interested to invest as a business angel. So mm -hmm. venture capital co-investment, is the interest in venture capital co-investment is growing. Mm -hmm. We see it also sector specific themes as technology and healthcare are, are more and more important. That's, yes, that's the main, that's the main trend we see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Bea, um which trends do you see? Is it a something like a topic that is becoming more, more focused on or is it investment strategies that are coming up more than over the last years? I think in particular with the current the very turbulent time that we are currently experiencing uh, globally, there is a clear flight to quality in terms of managers and also to COVID resilient assets from, for LPs. Huh? Um, if you see uh, those days, uh, the, the prices for, for some COVID resilient assets, it's, uh, it's really uh, you know, uh, getting a lot of attention, let's say it this way. So what does it mean in terms of practice? It means that for LPs, there is a focus on GPs that favor certain sectors, healthcare, education, data, software, business services, and more and more impact as well, uh, uh, impact investments. Um, we see um, more and more initiatives from GPs, but also more and more demand from, from LPs on that side. It also means that LPs are uh, looking for GPs that really support their companies with add-on acquisition, with support on digitalization, this crisis has in an accelerator of digitalization and LPs will want to understand to what extent the GPs have been supportive of their company and uh, in, in changing the business model for, for some of them. And not just by being a, a good financial engineering or, or, or cash management in the, in the current environment or, or uh, good negotiators with, um, with banks for, for that respect rank. I think uh, LPs will also um, expect uh, the GPs and their teams to be, uh, you know, perhaps more organized with operational teams and others. We see uh, more and more GPs now trying to um, 
split a bit their teams with uh, really a uh, origination team and operational teams. So the, the trend is this way, both for LPs and, and for GPs. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Bertel, um, so maybe less the trend in general, but mm -hmm. are there some certain topics you are uh, going to focus on or, or strategies? Um, no, I, I mean, as, as for, for trends, very briefly, I, I think you could call it a, a coming of age of the, of the whole industry mm -hmm. in, in, in a sense, um, which is positive or negative depends on, on which side of the knowledge gap you are. <laughs> I mean, if you're a total insider, it may not be totally positive for you because mm -hmm. you lose some of the, of the, of the premiums you, you could get. Um, as, as for, now th there was this, this, this idea in this panel about uh, making the, the asset class more accessible, also mm -hmm. f maybe for private persons and so on, which is um, on the one hand um, uh, a very nice, uh, nice, nice idea. Um, uh, let, let me introduce maybe a bit of a controversially, uh, controversial idea here. Um, it, this has the risk of, of, of carrying the seeds of its own destruction. Mm -hmm. Because why, why is there an asset class like private equity? It's um, in part, in not in the smallest part maybe, because uh, companies move away from public markets due to the cost of regulatory burden, um, which is directly in terms of cost, but also management time, management attention and so on. And we all, I think we know what, what we're talking about here. It's, it's very costly. Um, why are these regulatory burdens in place? Uh, to protect small investors. Mm -hmm. Now, if private equity becomes a mainstay, uh, becomes a, a commodity for, for private investors, we know at some point in time, bad things will happen. I mean, it always mm -hmm. happens. Some bad things always happen. And, uh, um, and as long as we have in our, it in our portfolio, we are not going to be protected, and which is fine. I mean, we are, we are, we are big and we are the grown-ups, really. Mm -hmm. um, but imagine 50, 100,000 uh, Austrian savers having private equity in their portfolios and being impacted, negatively impacted by mm -hmm. some bad things yep. happening. What the, the only possible answer for me is right now a, a big cry for more regulation, which then imperils the, the, the foundation of the whole asset class. Mm -hmm. So I think we, we need to, to move very carefully. It's, mm -hmm. it's simply impossible to protect everyone while at the same, um, at the same moment uh, reaping the rewards of this asset class for everyone. Mm -hmm. Okay, very interesting point of view. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Brunner, um, what is your opinion with trends? I'm, I'm sure that you hope for, uh, for uh, increasing demand for, <laughs> for, for Austrian uh, growth companies, um, but do you also see a trend um, due to certain strategies or, or topics? Or well, um, most probably I would say the, the, the unfortunate events of this year, meaning the health crisis that uh, resulted in an economic uh, crisis uh, actually all over the place, is, is already the good trigger. I mean, the only, yeah, good is a bad word for this, but is a trigger mm -hmm. for a trend change uh, that even in Austria, um, there seems to be now a real movement towards private equity. So mm -hmm. for me, this is one of the trend changes that mm -hmm. uh, banks like us, who never invested or uh, thought about something ab about uh, launching an own fund, are really taking this very seriously. And uh, we would hope for many others actually to join us yeah, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and join the idea. So I would say the main trend is it will become more and more um, socially acceptable, maybe not too fast for the retail tranche. And if retail investors will be invited, then in a really, I would say, economically by and large protected manner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But still, it could be wise to open this idea to the, to the retail area as well. But first of all, the trend will go into also inviting big institutional investors, the big boys and ladies <laughs> into the game. <laughs> and um, therefore, I think if we, if we manage to get this trend already, then we have already done a lot. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then I would like to say thank you to all of you for this very interesting talk. Um, I hope we mm -hmm. can do this next year again and see what <laughs> happens <laughs> <laughs> over the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we can summarize that uh, the trend towards private equity is strong. Um, everybody agrees on, the, I think, easing on regulations, but carefully so that nothing, nothing bad happens to too many people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you.